Well, and to be able to have your genetics being tailored to the, your feeding schedule, your feeding schedule tailored to the genetics, you can do that a little bit more with the organic aspect because it's almost like you're giving your plant the battery. And if that particular cultivar doesn't need as much juice, well, you're going to have more nu like nutrient-rich soil after the plant's done. It's not going to uptake everything as much. Versus others that are hungrier, you may have to add another scoop in, you know, midway through flower potentially even. Or again, the teas, the automatic tea, the, the instant tea with stash blend. You're giving it still some extra food consistently, but not all plants will need that. I've had some that I have to do less stash blend with, where it's a half a teaspoon, because they, they don't need more food. The base nutrients is a little too much adding that in, but it depends on the cultivar. I just think that you have a lot of people who think it one size fits all, and they see a program like Athena's program, and they think, ah, oh, I'm just going to run this, not realizing that certain genetics may need a little higher EC or lower EC. But if you do it like P and, and put it in your grow, if, if the genetic doesn't fit your routine, your style, it doesn't make the cut. You're going to spend so much time working uphill trying to change all of your process to be able to fit this new cultivar that may or may not be the one, you know, and I think that's that tough part of trying to have a finicky genetic or one that needs to be fed a little different. It's, it's some not, sometimes not always worth the squeeze, the juice isn't at least. Yeah, and these different grow styles, I mean, you could kind of adapt to uh, like the number of cultivars you're growing at once, right? Like I mentioned the difficulty of me growing six to, six to 12 different cultivars, and if I'm using synthetic nutrients, it's a little bit more difficult than using the organics, right? Let's warp over to hydroponics, right? Deep water culture, let's say it's an individual bucket. Well, you can tater each individual bucket with the nutrients that you're working with versus an RDWC system where it's all connected to a reservoir, all those plants are being fed the same exact nutrient mix. Well, you could see some variation in the way the plants are uptaken. Some plants could be struggling, uh, de deficient or borderline deficient, while others are, are toxic, has toxicity or borderline toxicity, right? And, and so it becomes more challenging depending on what style you're growing in. So there's something to keep in mind. Although, you know, if you're, if you're really hardcore on hydroponics, do you want to go the RDWC route where you're just topping off a reservoir and you have one nutrient mix per reservoir and you just hope for the best? Or do you want to manage each individual bucket? You know what I mean? It, it just becomes more labor intensive that way. So you really got to look at the pros and cons of things and just kind of pick what route you think is going to be best for you and, and your way of growing. I also should have put that in the, the Lazy Grower episode, the RDWC. That is, mm -hmm. a, It's such a simple... Or drain to waste. Such a simple process. I don't even think about it. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? It's like you, you also make up a good point when it comes down to your grow style as well. Because uh, I, I'm very train heavy in my garden. And it's it, it's easy to see that the abuse that my plants take are a little bit more than what they can be used to. So to adapt to that, you know, adding a, uh, adding a silica into the mix is going to give me a tougher plant cell wall a little more manipulable, malleable, so that I can train without any kind of real devastation to the plant. Um, you know, we've kind of talked about system, we've kind of talked about genetic in regards to treating them different, but it's like there's signs to look for. Like w when we talk about adaptive feeding and we talk about trying to get it right for our system, some things to look out for when, when when you say, well, how do I know if I need to adapt my feeding for my grow? Your plants are going to tell you. There, there are signs from the plant that are going to be, you're either going to be, as you mentioned, deficient. You know, the, the regimen that you were giving your garden before simply doesn't work for this, re for this genetic. So it could be too much. It could be too less. And you're looking for those signs. Like if you're, if you're deficient, the rule of thumb is is that yellowing is from the bottom up toxicity generally speaking is going to be something that's you know around the top of the plant or more consistently throughout the plant about the plant super dark leaves shiny yeah, curling yeah yep yep you know I, i'm not really good at troubleshooting but the 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 ones i'm really good at is you know nitrogen ni nitrogen tox is the dark leaves often a like a, a twist to the leaves as well really dark and they're not coming out that broad those those fingers are kind of doing this weird twist um that's nitrogen um i know that phosphorus can be like browning spots 
with like some some dark curling leaves deficiency of it yeah deficiency yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's like the the tough part is too is and there's always those variables like you have root damage or ph issues that are showing these other things so it's tough in that sense but learning to read the plant is going to help you with this adaptive feeding to be able to understand like okay this one right here looks like she's taking too much in because you can you see these signs and you know what you're feeding the plant it's it's one of those deals where if you don't have the data if you aren't keeping notes when you're doing these slight changes like i do it oftentimes in google keep i'll put it in there so like i'll have a separate tab essentially per genetic and i just will do little notes on each thing and it's just random thoughts like this one here sucked at cloning like just little shit but i've noticed that my feeding when i'm not keeping track of stuff and i bring a new genetic in and i'm like i'm just gonna feed it the same way i'm not noticing as it progressively deteriorates or gets worse it's just one day i look and i'm like oh shit what happened what was the deal versus when I'm consciously feeding this plant a little lower to see how she takes, a little higher to see how she takes, to kind of do it in a conscious way. And that's like tapering off some. You know, if I'm if I'm starting off with, let's say, bottled nutrients, oftentimes I'll go with, you know, 50 to 75% on the feeding with a lot of the genetics I have. Sometimes, though, honestly, I see people will go 100% and then wait until there's issues. Hmm. I'm a firm believer and I'd rather see a little bit of deficiency than toxicity. I'd rather feed a little more than be like, oh, shit, I got to dial it back. You know, that's my personal take. What about you guys? Do you go full strength and everything right away per genetic, or do you kind of low and then low and steady? I usually ramp up. It really depends on the uh, nutrient line, right? Not in all nutrient lines are created equal. Like I ran Fox Farm uh, for many, many years when I first began, and it was a very concentrated one. And I'd have to start it oftentimes a quarter dose or even a third of a dose in the very beginning and then work my way up. And I hardly ever touched a full dose. I'd just probably, uh, you know, I can name number of genetics on one hand that I actually ramped up to a full dose in flowering versus Athena, which I'm trying out right now for the first time. I've uh, grown a whole bunch of plants in that. Uh, I'm starting out with a half dose in veg, but full dose in flower. And that seems to be the theme. All the people I'm talking with, that uh, was some people do a full dose the whole way. And again, not all nutrient lines are created equal. Um, some of these lines are for this particular plant that we're growing, right? Uh, others are more for a wide variety of plants, like that Fox Farm formula. I mean, people are growing like, you know, lettuce, tomatoes, peppers, like all that stuff is kind of more of the focus versus canna. And so, um, yeah, I am oftentimes doing a lower dose, but it depends on what, uh, what nutrient line it is. Well, it's like I used to use Dynagro back in the day, and that was oh, primarily yeah. for orchids. Dynagro was crazy. I just had Dynagro bloom and veg, and that's all I'd use. And then I had a Protect I would use for a while, too. That was like a silica. So it's like just a super, super simple, and the bud was really good. It was all, it did its thing, but it was so concentrated. I mean, it came in a little bottle like this, and it would take care of 24 plants <laughs> easily for the whole cycle. So it was just, you couldn't go a little too heavy because it was that strong. And depending on the stuff, like like the Athena blend is pretty blended. It's a lot of water. So you're able to give it exactly what they say. And the plants do pretty well. Like I followed the program to a T and everything yielded good. Terps are there. It's, like, it's good, you know. However, when I try to do my old traditional way of I'm going to start low and steady and do all these things, I'm deficient as hell. Mm. I've got issues. So it's like they really give you, they arm you with the exact amount for success. Yeah. Versus others are like, hey, plant person, botanist, you should be able to figure it out. Read the plant. And it's like not everybody has that knowledge. And it took me years to be able to understand what read the plant meant. That sounded like some hippie, you know, Mr. Miyagi. Just wax on, wax off. You learn. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean read the plant, motherfucker? Where's the words? I'm like, oh, see the signs and understand deficiencies and toxicities. And when a plant's happy and when it's not in morphology of why it grows this way. And maybe it's not supposed to. Maybe it's my influence that's doing it. But then now I understand that I'd rather, like I said, low and steady because I don't want to have to build backwards from that wonkiness and that weird growth, single blade leaves and funkiness, you know, having to flush the plant. It becomes Ugh. more work, I feel, when you go too far versus too low and work your way up. This FTS clip was brought to you by AC Infinity, leaders in garden innovation. Use discount code THESTASH15 at checkout to save some money on your order. From the Stash Podcast.